Today's story may have ended with taking on one of the most dangerous criminal groups in the Stanton system, but it started out pretty simple with business meetings. I was having some pretty good luck with the network of new contacts I had been meeting recently on Microtech, and two of them had asked me to come visit the main city of New Babbage with some potential job leads. The trip from ARPCOR had been a long one, so when I arrived at Microtech, I suited up and stopped into Port Tressler, the space station in orbit above New Babbage, to reply to a couple of messages on my Omniglass and grab a drink while my Corsair got refueled. Once my ship and I both had a drink, I left the hangar as fast as I could and turned towards the planet's surface, where I knew a snow-covered city of opportunity waited for me. Most of the capital cities in the system have their own impressive views, although I have heard that it's tough to find one in Lorville on planet Hurston due to all the smog, but maybe I just need to visit and see it for myself. But every time I come to New Babbage, I can't resist flying through the snow-capped skyscrapers before I come in for a landing. My first client was going to be Marcy. In her messages, she said that she would be short on time, so I was going to grab some lunch while I waited for her. She also had asked me a lot about my flight experience while I was serving in the Bremen Defense Force before I came to Stanton and everything after. When I got back from throwing away my sandwich wrapper, Marcy was waiting for me. Marcy is a shipbroker and had a customer that wanted a small craft tested before he finalized his purchase. And even though I'm no ace pilot, she thought I'd be a good fit to take her client's prospective purchase for a test drive and that it would be waiting for me in a hangar. When I saw what this ship was, I stopped and did a double take. It was a car to wall, an alien ship originally made by the Xeon but modified for human use. My Fury Snub Fighter actually uses a lot of the same Xeon tech, so stepping into this cockpit felt kind of familiar. This was going to be fun. Like the Fury, the Cartowall uses multi-directional thrusters to make it nimble for its size. And while there are faster fighters out there with more firepower and smaller profiles to shoot at during combat, they can't do this. Marcy and her customer wanted me to put the fighter through its paces, and I thought I knew just where to do that. What better place to see how nimble the ship really was than through the towers and skyscrapers of the New Babbage skyline that I love flying through so much. It took a few minutes to get a hang of those alien controls, but once I did, I found out this thing could really move. I had tested everything from Sabres to the new Polaris during my time in the Defense Force back on Bremen, but I never flew anything quite like this. The only thing that came close to how easily this thing could change directions was my little fury, but the car to wall's added size made it a smoother, more controllable ride than its little cousin. I was enjoying myself so much, I hardly noticed that the sun was starting to set until the city lights began to blink on. I thought it was about time to get back on the ground and turn in my report to Marcy so I had time to rest before meeting my second client the next day. Oh, and if you couldn't tell, my recommendation for this ship was going to be buy it as fast as you can. If it had been me, that bill of sale would have been signed before the jets even cooled. The next day I got a call that my meeting had been pushed back a little bit, so I went directly to the Microtech store. Now, did I need a virtual reality capsule so that I could practice shooting down pirates and aliens in a video game when I wasn't doing it in real life? Maybe not, but did I want one? Well. I did until Greg showed me the price tag, and after I got over the sticker shock, I decided to peruse some of their more affordable tech and ship components before it was time to meet with Nick, who had some interesting intel to pass me. Nick was a private security contractor and had gotten wind of a pretty big operation by the Ninetales in the area. He was still getting all the details, but gave me the coordinates for a drop-off point the gang had been using to temporarily store their stolen goods and data and wanted me to disrupt their distribution chain. He also said that he was working on a couple of other leads and when I got back we'd meet again and hopefully he would have some more intel, but to be on the lookout while I was there for anything that could point us to their local base of operations. I found the river that Nick told me to look for as a landmark, but as I got towards the ground I immediately came under fire from a Cutlass Black. I had to remind them that the Corsair I was in was the bigger brother to their Cutlass, and then I started my approach towards the camp. 
Now, you may say that using a ship's guns to clear out the camp's population of murderous gang members is a bit unfair, but work smarter, not harder, as the old saying goes. I was pretty sure I had taken care of all the nine tails on the ground, but just to make sure, I grabbed my rifle and started towards the camp. As Frost started to collect on my armor, I knew I wouldn't have much time to explore, so I began cautiously working my way through the collection of shipping boxes and rubble they called a base. I didn't see many signs of life as I started picking my way through the debris, however I did spot a couple of boxes and crates that might hold intel or for that matter something useful I could store in the Corsair for later adventures. I didn't find much in the boxes that I checked other than food supplies and some ammo, so once I felt that I had found everything of use in the camp, I made my way towards the red Cutlass Black. I'm glad I had my helmet on because I'm sure the inside of this thing smelled like burnt gangster, but on the upside, at least I could defrost for a minute. As I moved from the cargo hold towards the front of the ship, I spotted the pilot who looked like he had tried to get out of his seat and got crushed in the process. His Omniglass had a message from an unknown sender containing four words, Go to Black Kite. I wasn't sure who or what Black Kite was, but I thought it was about time I left before another ship full of these guys showed up and got upset that their friends were extra crispy. I sent Nick an update and decided to follow the river to see if there were any more outposts, but I didn't see anything other than trees and snow-capped mountains. I'm glad I listened to my gut though. As I turned around and headed back to where I had started, I spotted another Cutlass Black full of nine tails waiting to be turned into scrap metal. Nick apparently was pretty fast at what he did. Before I had even left Atmosphere, he had run the term Black Kite through his database and found a job posting that he forwarded to me. Not long ago, I had stopped the pirate crew from taking over an 890 jump space yacht because I was worried about them adding it to their fleet and using it for all sorts of bad things. It looked like the Nines had the same idea and were using a stolen reclaimer salvage ship as a mobile base out in deep space. The name of that particular reclaimer was the Black Kite. The anonymous client said they had been trying to track down some important data only to find out that the ship it had been stored on was hit by the Black Kite which apparently had some serious encryption on their servers that prevented them from being accessed remotely. My job would be to locate the kite, go aboard, find a decryption key and insert it into the ship's server which would then allow the client to remotely access the system and pull the data they were after. If I could pull this off, not only would I have 50,000 extra credits in my pocket, but I could also take away one of the Ninetales' favorite toys by destroying the Black Kite. I had worked on board a couple of these reclaimers as salvage crew, and I knew they were huge, so I had no idea what I was about to run into. The airlock led directly into the habitation deck, so I decided to start my search there. These ships could be run with a pretty small skeleton crew, and for my sake, I hope that was the case on this one as well. Either way, I didn't want everyone on the ship knowing I was there, so I quietly made my way to the first room and found my first nine tails. Once I made sure he wasn't going to get back up, I turned around and realized I was in luck. The decryption key I was looking for was sitting right on the desk, so now all I had to do was find the server, insert the key, blow up the ship, and get out of there. Easy, right? Trying to remember the layout of the ship, the only place I could imagine that they would have room for a bunch of servers and computer equipment would be down in the cargo hold. But before I went down there, I wanted to make sure that no reinforcements from up on this level were going to be sneaking up on me later and ending my lucky streak. Once I had cleared the crew quarters and the mess hall without finding anything but proof that these guys didn't put taking out the trash very high on their to-do list, I dropped another bad guy, checked my ammo, and continued on towards the front of the ship. Everything seemed pretty quiet here, but I knew just ahead I'd have to make a decision. There was an elevator that would take me down to the bridge, or I could turn around and head towards the aft end of the ship, where another elevator would take me down to the cargo area, where I guess the servers and more Ninetales were waiting for me. I decided to go with the second choice and started to retrace my steps towards the back end of the ship. As I spotted the elevator at the end of the hallway, I remembered something else about reclaimers. This elevator could also take me to a walkway overlooking the cargo bay that usually was used by supervisors to make sure the crew was staying on task, but would give me the high ground to spot and take out any nines that were guarding the servers. 
They only had placed one sentry up here as a lookout and I was able to take him out before I even left the elevator. With him out of the way, I could start picking off the remaining bad guys down below. The first couple hit the floor without anyone else realizing that their numbers were dwindling, but soon they caught on and started throwing lead back at me. I ducked and headed towards some armor plating that I saw at the other end of the room that I hoped would be thick enough to soak up any incoming fire as I continued to clear the room. I had definitely made a dent in their numbers, but I heard more moving around, so I got into a new position and took out the last couple that I could see. I didn't want to find out the hard way that I had missed one of these guys when I got down there, so as I headed back towards the elevator, I kept an eye out for anything moving below. Having not seen anything, I got back on the lift and descended one more level to try and find the server access point. Not knowing exactly what the console would look like, I slowly moved forward and started looking for anyone that was still moving and any computer equipment that looked important. The big red glowing console ahead of me looked like it would fit the bill, but before I decrypted the server, there was a burrito that looked like it needed saving. Priorities, right? With the burrito safe and sound, I inserted the decryption key and waited for something to happen. The green message that flashed up on the screen looked like a good sign, so I figured my job in this part of the ship was done. Now, I just needed to figure out how to destroy the ship so it couldn't be used for any more of their operations. I had an idea, but to pull it off, I'd need to retrace my steps again and go all the way to the bridge at the front. Things seem pretty quiet now, but I still took my time and made sure to clear my corners. After getting this far, I didn't want any surprises. The door to the bridge opened, so I moved forward. For part one of my plan to work, I needed to get to the pilot's seat. I quickly sat down and found the button I was looking for. Shields offline. For part two of my plan, all I had to do was retrace my steps one more time and get back to the airlock where my ship was waiting for me. I made it back without incident and I couldn't help but smile as I took a running leap into space, knowing that I had just taken away valuable data from one of the most dangerous groups in the system and as soon as I got back behind the controls of the Corsair, I'd be taking an even bigger asset of theirs away, permanently. Reclaimers are tough ships, but thanks to the Corsair, I didn't have to stay on the triggers long before the black height finally disappeared. I had finished up just in time. As I turned around to leave, a freelancer dropped out of the asteroids and opened fire on me. Not knowing if more people were about to show up to the party, I flew past him and made a jump back to Microtech. Today had been a good day, and I owed Nick a drink. Thank you for sticking around till the end. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe down below so that you'll know next time I post a Star Citizen story.